One of the stories that Jesus used to tell was a story about a banquet. Uh, there was a man, and sometimes when he told the story, he was just a wealthy man. Sometimes he was a king. Uh, but there was this wealthy king who would invite people to a banquet in honor of his son who was getting married. So it was a wedding banquet. And, and effectively, the king would send out his servants with a wedding invitation. And as the servants went out into the town with the wedding invitation, they would go to the people the king had designated to be invited and say, hey, you are invited to this banquet. And Jesus would tell the story that all of the people declined. Some because they were too busy. Some because they had business to attend to. Some because their relationships wouldn't allow it. But for whatever reason, everyone said, no, we can't come to the banquet. And so the king said to his servants, I want you to go out again and invite them again, but this time I want you to tell them about our preparations. Tell them about the food that we've gotten ready and the drink and the music and, and how this is going to be a great party and they're invited. And so the servants went back out and told everyone, hey, you don't understand what, what a big banquet this is going to be. You don't want to miss it. And yet again, everyone who was invited rejected the invitation. And so the king was now a little bit angry and said to his servants, I'm going to send you back out again, and this time you go out into the streets and you find anyone you can find and you drag them here. And so the servants went out and, and they found everyone, and the parable says, even the good and the bad, uh, the lame, the blind, the poor, the oppressed, the homeless, and, and they dragged them all in to come to the banquet of the king. Now here's the thing, when you go to a wedding, you get dressed up, right? We all want to go to a wedding and look our best because it's such an important occasion for the bride and the groom. We want to look our best for them. We wear wedding clothes. But the only time I ever put on a suit and a tie is when I'm doing a wedding. They're my wedding clothes. But these people that were coming to the banquet now, they didn't have wedding clothes. Remember, these are the people off the street. They're getting dragged in. And so the king said, I will give everyone who comes to the banquet their own wedding garment. And he demanded that everyone who came to the banquet wear the wedding garment that he had provided because he wanted everything to be perfect for his son whom he loved. Now in this story, in Matthew 22, when Jesus was telling it, there's one wedding guest who comes in not wearing the appropriate wedding attire. And I want you to listen to the interaction between uh, the king and this guest. This is from Matthew 22, verse 11. But when the king came in to look at the guests, he saw there a man who had no wedding garments. And he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he, the, the guest, was speechless. And then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot and cast him into outer darkness. Now, now, Jesus is telling us a story here about eternity. He's telling a story about what happens when we step out of this life and into the next. What happens when we die? And his point is that, that, that God has extended this invitation to a great banquet in eternity. Yet it's an invitation that many have rejected. But for those who accept it, God has provided new garments. You see, it's important to understand that to go to the eternal banquet, to step in eternity, to spend eternity with God, we can't be who we are today. There must be some kind of transformation. You see, we can't step into eternity wearing this world's clothes. Something about us has to change. And in the story Jesus tells, the, the picture is that of wedding garments. Now, in Ephesians 2, Paul kind of is making the same kind of teaching. He's saying when we step into eternity, when we step out of this world and into the next, unless something has changed about us, we cannot be there with God. And so Paul paints this picture, it's kind of like a before-after picture of who we used to be, who we once were, and who we are once we have Christ in our life. And this before-after picture gives us an idea of what it means to be transformed so that we can spend eternity with God the Father. 
Now, as we walk our way through Ephesians 2, 1 through 7 this morning, I want you to pay attention to three phrases that we're going to see. The first phrase is, and you. The second is, but God. And the third is, so that. And here's how they work together. And you is talking about how you used to live, how you used to be, the way you were born, what you were naturally. This is the state of every person. And it's kind of a dark picture. But, but then he's going to say, but God. And here's the cool thing. So it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what you've been doing. It doesn't matter where you've gone in your life or what wrong things you've done. God intervenes. And just like the king provides new clothes for his wedding guests, God provides a new life for you. And so, and you, you were like this, but God intervened and did this for you so that something really good could happen. All right, so that's, that's kind of the rough outline of what we're going to see today in Ephesians 2, 1 through 7. It's a before-after picture. It helps us know where we've been and where we're going. And you, but God, so that. All right? So if you have your Bibles, you can open them to Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, if you have the Version app, you can open that up or anything else on your phone or your tablet. If you want to follow along, we'll also have the words up on the screen behind me. This is what Paul writes. He says, and you... We're dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. Following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. So this is not a very complimentary picture Paul is painting he says, and you were what? And you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Now, now when you hear the word dead, you probably think of physical death. Uh, when the Bible talks about death, there's actually at least three different ways it uses that word. And I want to talk about all three of them this morning. Uh, but let's start with physical death, because physical death is separation of body and soul. It's when life ends, Right? We're all going to reach that point in our life when our body will be separated from our soul. That's it for the body. It goes into the ground, but our soul goes on living eternally, either with God or without God. That's physical death. Do you know what you have to do to qualify for physical death? You have to go through physical birth. Because everyone who's been born dies. That's just the reality of this world. Everyone who's been born dies. James wrote, it is appointed unto all men once to die. So we all die physically. But, but there's another kind of death that the Bible talks about, and this is spiritual death. Spiritual death is separation from relationship with God. You see, sin always causes separation. When, when we do something that we know is wrong, it causes separation. How many of us have had a relationship that's been broken because we've not treated someone as we should? When we do wrong, it separates us. And the same is true with God. When we don't follow God's law, God's guidelines, it separates us from Him. We're no longer able to live in relationship with Him, and we were created to be in relationship with Him. Now, now here in Ephesians 2, Paul actually walks through four reasons why we are spiritually dead. And all of us fit in this category. The first reason he gives that we are spiritually dead is because we followed this world. Listen to what he writes. He says, you're, you're dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world. Now, now this word following, you could also think of this as influenced by. All of us follow. We follow people. We follow ideas. We're influenced. And, and whatever it is that you choose to follow influences you to be the person that you are. So what I allow to be poured into my life, whatever influences that may be, maybe it's social media, maybe it's television, maybe it's movies, maybe it's music, maybe it's the books I read, the people I hang out with, all of these ideas that I follow, they change me and they make me who I am. And Paul says one of the reasons we are separated from God is because we follow this world. You see, the world tells us that we ought to chase after power and pleasure and possessions. And when we chase those, they lead to separation because God's way is that we choose servanthood and submission 
and contentment and generosity. But far too often we choose the world's way and we follow the world's ideals and the world's agenda and that separates us from God. And Paul goes on to say it's not just that that separates you. You're also separated from God because you follow the spirit of the air, which is the devil. You see, in the Bible, it's really clear that that Satan is a real being. Now, he's a real being who seeks to destroy God's people but by tempting them and and trying them. But I want you to see the words that Paul uses here to describe the devil because it's important for us to understand something about him. The devil is a created and limited being. See, Paul says here he's what? He's the prince of the power of the air, not the king. He's not the most powerful being. He's the prince. He's limited. And and of the power of the air, that's that's a place. The, The devil exists in a place. He's not everywhere. He can't be everywhere because he's a created being. He's limited to one place at a time. And he says he's now working, which is to say not forever. The the devil is limited. He's limited in his power. He's limited in where he can be. And he's limited in how long he can work for. But right now, right now, he is bringing temptation and trying to destroy God's people. And so when we give in to temptation, we're following the ways of the prince of the power of this air. And when we give in to temptation and do what we know we ought not to do, we separate ourselves from God. Beyond that, Paul also says, that we're separated from God because we follow our own cravings. He says we follow our own passions, the cravings of our heart and mind. You see, there are times when we say, I've got to have what I want, when I want it, how I want it now. This is kind of how we are naturally, isn't it? This is, this is the cravings of our heart. Uh, yesterday I was listening to a podcast and I shut it off because I got so frustrated with it because one of the guests on it went into this whole spiel about how you need to stop listening to your mind and start listening to your heart. This is pretty common advice these days, and it's really bad advice. Don't listen to your heart. Proverbs says that the heart is what? Desperately wicked and deceitful. It takes you in the whole wrong directions. Our cravings are those things that we first want and are almost always bad for us. Do you know what I crave? You do. You know that I crave Swiss cake rolls. And there is nothing good and redeeming in Swiss cake rolls. They are not good for me. And so a sign of maturity is when I can say, I crave the Swiss cake roll, but I choose the carrot. Right? That means that I'm making progress. I'm growing up. I'm becoming more mature. And yet Paul says, when we give in to our cravings, what we think we want right now, when we follow our heart, that separates us from God. Let me explain to you why it works this way. You see, when I'm following Christ, when I'm filling my mind with His Word, and I'm being around His people, and I'm listening to people talk about Him, the first place that sets in is my mind. And then the more I let it fill my mind, it transfers down to my heart. But there is that time when we want one thing with our heart and we know something different with our mind. Have you been there? And when you listen to your heart, you're running the wrong way. Let God fill your mind. Let that filter to your heart, but don't follow your heart. Don't follow the cravings of this world. Don't follow the passions and the desires that you have. Choose instead to follow Christ. Because when you follow your cravings, when you follow your passions, it separates you from God. And and if any of us have ever done that, and we all have, then we're in a state of separation. We're in a state of spiritual death. Paul gives us one more reason why we're separated from God. He says, it's just natural. We are all by nature children of wrath. He says, you're born this way. We are born separated from God. Paul wrote in Romans 5 that from one man death entered into the world. And it's been passed on to all of us. You see, all of us, because of Adam and Eve's sin, are born sinful. And I know that doesn't seem fair, does it? Because we say, I would have chosen differently if I had been given the choice. No, you wouldn't have. And all of us demonstrate that all of the time. Whenever we make choices to follow our way or follow the world's way or follow temptation's way, we're showing that we would have done the same thing that Adam and Eve did. And if you don't believe it's true that we're born sinners, take a look at a baby. Babies are wonderful and they're a gift from God and they are cute and they are cuddly and they smell nice sometimes. But they are born sinners. No baby is born as a kind and compassionate person. 
No baby for the first several years of their life says, how can I serve you? Babies are like, give me what I want now. That's what they mean when they cry. They're not saying, oh, I love you so much. They're saying, gimme, 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 because babies are selfish because we're born sinful. And so Paul says we are all born into this state of spiritual death, and this is bad news. You see, because physical death plus spiritual death equals eternal death. This is the final, the final type of death. Eternal death is separation from the presence of God. See, if you are born into this world, you live in the presence of God. Whether you believe in God or not, you experience the blessings of living in his presence. Because he sustains our world. He makes sure everything works. He causes the sun to rise and the sun to set. He causes it to rain when it needs to rain. He causes the grass to grow. He keeps our world spinning as it needs to spin. He makes sure we don't get too close to the sun or too far from the sun. Our world is perfectly placed and timed for life to exist, and that is the sustaining presence of God. Eternal death is removal from the presence of God. 2 Thessalonians 1 says that for those who do not believe in God, they will suffer eternal death punishment. In Matthew 25, Jesus said, those who are not true followers of me will be subject to eternal punishment. Revelation 20 and 21 say there is a second death, not physical death, but a second death, which is an eternal death, eternal separation from the presence of God. And and I want you to think about what that means to be separated from God's presence. It means to be removed from anything that brings meaning to life. It means an ever- everlasting state of confusion, not understanding, things being ripped apart, torment, suffering. This is what happens to those who die as spiritually dead people. This is really bad news because all of us are going to die physically and all of us are born spiritually dead. And so all of us are hurtling through life towards eternal death. This is what Ephesians 2, 1 through 3 says. The good news is Paul didn't finish there, did he? In fact, the next two words that he writes are maybe the most important two words ever written in the history of mankind. He says this, but God. See, you are going to die. And you are born spiritually dead. And so you are hurtling towards eternal death, but God, listen, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us even when we were dead in our trespasses made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. This is fantastic. You see, what Paul is saying is all this bad stuff, this death stuff, dead in your sins, dead in your trespasses, eternal death, that's who you were. That's the past. That's where you once lived. But now it's different because now God has stepped into the picture and God is full of riches. And when when Paul says riches, he's saying it's an overabundance. It's more than enough. It's an overflow that he pours into our lives. And notice how Paul describes the riches of God. He gives us four words to describe God's riches in this this verse. He says God's riches are demonstrated through his mercy, through his love, through his grace, and through his kindness. God's riches, mercy, love, grace, and kindness. Let's walk through what those mean. Mercy. Mercy is when I don't receive what I deserve. All right, so so if if I'm going too fast down the highway, And the officer pulls me over and says, David, why were you going 100 miles an hour in a 70 mile an hour zone? And I say, I don't know. I was listening to the Tigers. I was excited. I'm sorry. And he says, well, you know what? I'm a Tiger fan too, so I'm going to let you off this time. He's given me, he's given me mercy. He's not given me what I deserve. And God's mercy to us is demonstrated in that when we sin, when we mess up, when we rebel against us, he doesn't destroy us. The fact that we get to continue living even when we do wrong is evidence of God's mercy in our life. God's God's riches are demonstrated through mercy and through his love. 
Love is sacrifice, right? The mother who constantly gives of herself for her children. The soldier who gives his life for his country. Love is sacrifice, and God's love to us is demonstrated through Jesus, who came and gave his life for us to purchase our redemption from sin. God was willing to give everything to buy us back because he loves us so much. God's riches are demonstrated to us through His grace. Mercy is when we don't get what we do deserve. Grace is when we're given something that we don't deserve. When I give my kids a cookie, that's grace. When the sun rises, none of us have earned that, that's grace. When I'm promoted without merit, that's grace. You see, grace is when I receive something that I haven't earned. And Paul says that salvation comes through grace. None of us have done anything to earn God's salvation. In the story where we started, where the king sent out the wedding robes to all of the guests, that's grace. They hadn't earned those garments. They didn't deserve those garments. They didn't deserve to be invited to the banquet. And yet, graciously, the king gave them all of that, just like God has graciously given us salvation, even though we haven't earned it. And his his riches are demonstrated through us through Kindness. Kindness is gentle goodness. So, so when you have the ability to, to be strong and powerful and do whatever you want, but instead you use that and, and you're good to those around you gently. There, there's a story in the Old Testament that's all about kindness. It's the story of David and Mephibosheth. Last year when we walked through the life of David, uh, Ray preached about this passage for us, and he did a great job describing this story. Mephibosheth was a descendant of Saul, who was king before David. And when David rose to power, all of the descendants of Saul ran for their lives because in those days when a new king came in, he destroyed the family of the old king. But David wasn't like any other king. And and one day David said, I loved Saul's son Jonathan, and so for Jonathan's sake I want to show kindness to the house of Saul. Are there any descendants of Saul who are still alive? And someone said there's this one guy, Mephibosheth, but but he's lame. He was, he was dropped as a child. He can't walk. Um, and David said, bring him to me. And, and Ray painted this picture for us when he preached this passage of, of how Mephibosheth came and David raised him up and seated him at the king's table. And how that's a picture of, of this idea that Mephibosheth was now equal with all of David's family. And he's a part of David's household, even though he didn't deserve it. And for the rest of his life, David treated Mephibosheth with kindness. And you see that this is foreshadowing what Jesus does for us. Because Jesus does what? He raises us up and he seats us at the Father's table. And he treats us kindly for the rest of our lives. That's what it says in Ephesians. That God may show us kindness when? In the ages to come. See, an age is this world. And there are ages to come after this world. That's eternity. And God's whole plan, this is the so that. God's whole plan is that he was willing to purchase us, to buy us back, to show us mercy and love and grace so that in eternity he can demonstrate kindness to us by raising us up and seating us at his banquet table. David wrote about this in Psalm 23. Remember Psalm 23? David wrote this. He said, You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Now listen, this is maybe the best part of the psalm. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You see, we don't deserve anything but death. But God, who is rich in mercy and rich in love and rich in grace and rich in kindness, but God has invited us to his table so that in the ages to come, he may pour his kindness out on us. And so the question for us this morning is a really simple one. Will you accept the invitation? Will you accept God's invitation? Will you be a part of his banquet? Jesus gave his life so that you can have eternal life. See, all of us are going to die, physical death. And all of us are born spiritually dead. But for those of us who accept the invitation, for those of us who give our lives to Jesus, 
we are rescued from spiritual death and made alive spiritually. And those who die physically but are alive spiritually are given eternal life instead of eternal death. That's the invitation. For some of us, for some of us, we've accepted this invitation a long time ago. And this morning maybe serves as a really good reminder that when we accept the invitation of Jesus, we're given new garments. We're given wedding garments. And we need to put those on. We ought to today look different than we did yesterday. We ought to be constantly going through a process of shedding the old clothes of the old world and putting on the new clothes that God has given to us. And so maybe if you're like me this morning when we talk about accepting the invitation, this is the time to say, what can I shed that's from the old me? And what has Jesus given me that I can put on to live in his presence? In Christ, we are invited. And so this morning we're going to remind ourselves of that by accepting the invitation to come to the table. This is God's table. This is communion. And we celebrate communion here at the gathering. Uh, it's a reminder to us of what Jesus has done for us and who he has made us and who we are going to be in the future. And so this morning we want to remind ourselves of that. I'm going to have the, the band come on up. And in just a minute I'm going to pray and then while, after I pray, they're going to play a song for us. And while they're playing, the invitation is open. Uh, you can come and join us at the table. We celebrate what we call open communion here. And what that means is that we don't decide who's in and who's out. We don't decide who can come to the table and who can't. That's between you and God. And so if you've accepted Jesus' invitation, then you're invited to the table. And we'd love to have you join us. Uh, as the band is playing... Uh, come on down, take one of the crackers, take one of the, the cups of juice and go back to your seat. And once everyone's been served, then together we'll, we'll partake. But as you sit there, I want you to think this morning about God's invitation to you. Whether you'll accept that invitation. Think about God's riches, his mercy, his love, his grace, his kindness, his faithfulness. Let's pray. Father, we were lost without you, and you reached out and found us. Thank you. And I pray this morning for those who are, who are still seeking for you, who are seeking for truth, who are trying to find meaning in this life. I pray that, that they would this morning hear your invitation and accept it, that they would give their lives to you. So they no longer need to fear what comes next. They no, need, no longer need to live with the the shame and regret of their past, but can go forward knowing that you have made them new. Help us all to accept your invitation to put on your clothes, to shed the clothes of the old life. In your name, amen.